very much. I could hear both of them this morning, and I appreciate that. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers, if they would, to come this morning. We want to give you an opportunity to give. Appreciate your faithfulness in giving week after week. In needs of the church continue to be met, and we thank you for that. It's a joy and a privilege to give into the kingdom of God. I hope you understand that. I hope that you see the blessing that comes, because God doesn't just say, give me your money. First of all, God says, bring back the tithe that belongs to him. In fact, he says, if we don't, we're robbing from him. But, but more than that, he says, if you'll, if you'll give the tithe back, he says, I'll pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. And I know I've seen that in my life many, many times, and I thank God for that. So, Father, we come this morning with praise and thanksgiving. Lord, we come with our worship to you before, before your throne this morning, thanking you for all that you provide in our lives. And Father, as we bring this envelope, this check, this cash, whatever it may be, Lord, and we deposit it in this bag today, it's, it's Father, not giving necessarily to Ozark Bethel Chapel. Lord, we're giving into the kingdom of God. And Father, we believe that according to your word, you will bless. It is soil that will bring forth fruit and, and, and supply in our lives, Lord. It will bring a blessing, God, according to the promises of God. So Father, we come with thanksgiving, with praise, and with anticipation as we give into your kingdom today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's been somewhat of a busy week for us, not, not un, I shouldn't say too uh, ter terribly unusual, just a little bit more than what we've experienced since we've been at Ozark Bethel Chapel. Uh, I, am, I have been very thankful since we've been up here. Our schedule has slowed down considerably in a lot of ways. Now, I really don't expect that to last. I think part of that is being a newbie in the area. I haven't learned all that I'm supposed to be doing yet, but I'm, I'm learning and finding things. And so uh, it's been a little bit of a busy week. We've had a funeral in the week, had to run pick up Convoy of Hope stuff. We've had to go to Dexter for a doctor's appointment. And then we had to camp, went to the campground three days for a prayer encounter, which was powerful. Thank God for that. And I, I just say with that on my mind and heart, church, we need to be in prayer. We need to be a people of prayer. If my people who are called by my name, you know the scripture, will humble themselves and pray. We're the ones that are gonna pray and make a difference in our world. And church, our world needs us to pray, let alone we need to be praying for ourselves and for our own families. So I wanna encourage you, if you have allowed busyness, if you have allowed, in fact, got my toes stepped on real good by the first preacher that preached uh, Friday or Thursday night talking about when you allow other things to get in the way of your prayer time, you're, you're falling down on your commitment on what you're called to do. And it's so easy to allow, whatever it may be, you get up and you hit the ground running. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, I mean, your feet hit the floor and off you go. Sometimes we need to set the clock a little earlier set something aside, whatever, we need to be spending time before God. And I want to encourage you to do that. But today I want to take you to one of the, what I believe to be one of the most pivotal chapters in the New Testament. To me it is. I, I don't know if I've shared with you, but I did not grow up in Pentecost or in the Assemblies of God. And Mikey, if you want to go ahead and get that first slide up on the screen there, that uh, that kind of introduction uh, slide there and get us started. But I didn't grow up in the Assemblies of God. I didn't grow up in Pentecost at all. I grew up in the General Baptist Church, uh, and, and my dad was called himself a Baptistal all his life. Uh, he was a, an excitable prayer warrior, uh, a crybaby, <laughs> and I say that respectively. Uh, I'm thankful that my dad was a crybaby and told me, taught me that not, not by his words, but by his actions, that there's nothing, not a thing wrong with shedding a tear as a man. And when the Lord comes upon me, I, I can begin to bawl and weep very easily. And I guess I learned that from watching my dad. But I didn't grow up in, in Pentecost. And as I began to be introduced to it when I went to college, there was not a general Baptist church in Rolla when I went to college there. And so I had to find some place to attend church and met a guy on my dorm floor, became my very best friend for many years until he passed away about, uh, I guess it's been almost 10 years ago now. He passed away, and, but he introduced me to the Assemblies of God and, and introduced me to Pentecost and I began to attend church and began to, 
to look into the Pentecostal movement, began to look into its doctrines and its teachings. And the, the idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was kind of strange to me and I didn't understand it. But this chapter we're going to look at here in a few minutes is a chapter that really opened my eyes and continues to be to me a bigger proof of the reality, the, the importance, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit that God wants in every one of our lives. Not just in me as the pastor, and, and more and more today I see this, is that I think so many people within the church expect the pastor to be filled with the Holy Spirit, for the pastor to be a spiritual influence, but they don't see a need for it necessarily in their own life. They're born again, they're on their way to heaven, and I agree with that. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not necessary to bring us to heaven, but I believe it is an important thing. But before I look at this chapter, there's a few verses I wanna show you this morning uh, that are instrumental to help us to hear what the Spirit would say to us today. Romans chapter 15 and verse four says this, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Do you hear that? What was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, now these things happen to them, talking about those in the Old Testament, the scriptures, these things happen to them as an example and they were written down for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. So twice here in the New Testament we see Paul writing and saying those things in the Old Testament were written down for our benefit. They were written down that we could learn from them. Why did things happen the way they had? Well, for instance, you read in the book of John chapter, chapter 10, I believe it is, chapter nine or 10, the young man that is born blind, that was born blind and Peter and the disciples, Jesus and the disciples, excuse me, come to the gate and there he is and he's, he's sitting there begging and the disciples said to him, whose sin caused him to be born blind, whether it's his father's sin or his mother's sin? And Jesus made this powerful statement, says it wasn't because of the sin in either one of them, but in order that I might be glorified, that God might be glorified in this moment. In other words, this young man had been blind all his life in order to bring Jesus glory at this particular time in his ministry. Now, I'm getting this look from you all right now that says, what? God would let somebody be born blind? Yeah. For his purpose, for his goal, for his glory. What I mean by that, what, what, what it all comes together, this things happen to individuals for our instruction. Second Timothy chapter three says this in verse 14 to 17. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So when we open the word of God and we begin to read, God is giving us this word to instruct us, to teach us, to train us so that we might be equipped for what he is calling us to do. Do you believe that you have a calling on your life? Every one of us have a calling of God on our lives. God did not bring us into the kingdom of God to be uh, welfare, welfare recipients in the kingdom. You know what I mean? He didn't call us in the kingdom so that we could just take, take, take. God has a purpose and a calling for all of us. Scripture was recorded for this purpose that we might hear and receive and learn. I wanna read 1 Corinthians 10, 11 to you again. We, we read it a while ago, but this is in the Amplified Version. Listen carefully. Now these things befell them 
by way of a figure as an example and a warning to us. They were written down to admonish and fit us for right action by good instruction. We in whose days the ages have reached their climax, their consummation and concluding period. The things of God are mysterious. I would even say that they're somewhat hidden, but not hidden so as to not be found. Treasures are hidden in order to be found. God God has made things somewhat mysterious so that we must seek them out. In fact, Jeremiah 29, 11, you know this verse well, you will seek me and find me when? When you seek for me with all your heart. God says you'll find what you're looking for in me if you'll really search for it. Again, not to be a welfare recipient in the kingdom of God. But when you come after God truly with your whole heart, God wants to reveal himself to you and to me. Do you believe that? God is not hiding from you so that you cannot discover him. He is is holding things in a mysterious way, in a hidden way, in a secret way, so that you will have to truly pursue him. Maybe you've seen a, or watched a movie about some especially, and I'm, I'm not picking on the ladies, but some, some lady, some woman who is being pursued by her, her pursuer, her, her mate, her, her boyfriend, whatever it may be, and she just kind of seems to be distant. She just, and, and as you watch the show or you experience this in life, you find out that it's all about, she just wants to make sure he's serious. Huh? You know what I mean? God is mysterious because he wants to know that we're serious. You'll search for me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. So this morning, I'm praying that we will search for God diligently, that we will be willing to take the instruction of God's word and apply it to our lives carefully. So I want us to look together in the book of Acts at chapter eight and gain some some serious instruction, teaching, and training today as we look at verses 4 through 24. Let me give you a little background. The, 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 the uh, deacon Stephen has been called before the Sanhedrin, before the Jewish leadership, because he's been preaching Jesus. And they, they tell him he's not to preach this. And so he begins to talk to them and to share a message with them. And, and the seventh chapter of, of Acts is, is that message that he shares. And at the end of that message, it is so powerful. They're under such conviction. It says they gnashed their teeth. <sighs> they gnashed their teeth at him, drug him outside the city, and they stoned him to death. So Stephen has just been stoned. And in Acts chapter 8, it says that because of that, a great persecution arose against the church or against the way following Stephen stoning. And who led that persecution? None other than the apostle Paul, who was not the apostle Paul yet. He was still Saul. But the, but the persecution didn't silence It didn't dampen the things of God. In fact, God used that persecution to scatter the church abroad to take the message. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. Well, they were doing that. But he also said Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. The problem is sometimes we get so comfortable inside these four walls. Hello? We get so comfortable inside these four walls that God's gotta come in here and stir the pot a little bit to get us to scatter and take the message. And that's what he did. And through Stephen's stoning, persecution arose. Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul, Saul begins to to arrest Christians and throw them in jail, even having some uh, killed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So we pick up reading in Acts chapter eight, beginning at verse four. It says, therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ. And now Philip was one of the deacons. He was right alongside Stephen in, in his position, his place within the church. 
He, they've been chosen as deacons to serve tables in the feeding of the people. They were such a large group. They were feeding people every day. Philip and Stephen were called to serve the tables. Do you understand that there's no position in the kingdom of God that is minor and small? Table servers became preachers of the gospel. What I'm trying to say is just because you're not up there in front doesn't mean you can't be out there sharing the gospel. It doesn't mean that you don't have a calling and position in the kingdom of God to share Jesus Christ with everyone. Philip or Stephen, powerful message that he, that he preaches brings these leaders under conviction, but instead of them repenting, they stone him to death. Philip goes about, goes down to Samaria and begins to preach the word of God. And we're going to read a great revival took place because of a table server preaching the gospel. Not because of an evangelist, not because of, uh, of an apostle, not because of uh, some big TV evangelist spreading the word, because of a guy who, who waited tables was willing to preach the gospel. Let's go on. <clears throat> so the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs he was performing. That's important for you to see that. And they saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. Now remember what I said last week about the supernatural power of God, that it is often used, it's often attached to the preaching of the gospel. It's attached to outreach. The, the supernatural, uh, whether it's healings, whether it's casting out demons, raising, but whatever it is, it's, it's usually attached to outreach. We often want to, to take the supernatural and box it inside our church again, and we want the supernatural to work on us, but we forget that God does the supernatural in order to confirm his word. And we need to be taking the supernatural. And I'm preaching to me right here today. We need to be taking the supernatural, every one of us, outside the church to confirm the word of God that we're telling them that Jesus saves, that Jesus is the answer. Let me tell you this. If you're talking to somebody and they're not a Christian and maybe they tell you they're not a Christian, they're not a believer, whatever, and you say, hey, uh, is there anything, I, can, I mean, are you struggling with something? You're sick, problems, whatever. And, and they tell you, yeah, I've got this or I've got that. And you pray for them and what you pray about happens. Maybe uh, the sore is healed. Maybe the, the finances are provided. Maybe the direction is given. You pray and it happens. Do you think that that's gonna have a greater effect on their lives? That's what the supernatural is all about. Yes, God does want to care for his people, but God wants to advance the kingdom of God. So Philip went preaching, signs were taking place. Verse eight, so there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and was astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. Satan will falsify, Satan will, will deceive even with the supernatural. And that's what was going on. The Samaritans were being deceived before Philip come into believing this, this man called Simon, who was a magician. And I don't mean uh, an illusionist, I'm talking about a supernatural demonic magician. Verse 11, and they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip, when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So, so we see the people are believing in Jesus, being baptized. Even Simon is believing and was baptized. Verse 14. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit 
For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they, Peter and John, began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed, notice that phrase, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You could buy your place in the kingdom. You have no part or portion in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this weakness of yours and pray that the Lord, pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me yourself so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Again, this chapter, this passage of scripture, to me is one of the strongest messages concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's reality, it's necessity, and it's evidence in the church, in the body of Christ. We're going to look at it this morning. Father, I pray right now that you'd begin to open every heart and every mind. Give, Lord, that every attention would not be given to me, but to your word this morning and to the declaration, Lord, of your message today. Father, I pray that every ear would be open and that, that God, we would gain insight, not just with our mind, but Lord, with our heart. That, Father, our spirit would be moved and would be changed to bring us understanding concerning your will for the believers who follow you. Father, I, I put myself in your hands. God, I pray for your anointing and your direction in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The first thing I want you to recognize here is that salvations were occurring under Philip's ministry. Philip was preaching the word and people were being saved. Salvations were occurring. Go right ahead, Mike, with that next slide. First, we, we need to understand we've got to take God's word for what it says. It says that they believed. They believed what Philip was preaching. They were being baptized. So this makes it very clear that these people were truly being born again and being uh, brought into the kingdom of God. It wasn't that they sort of believed, that they halfway believed, that they were kind of understanding. It says that they were being brought into the kingdom. They were believing they were being baptized. Even Simon, this sorcerer, believed in the gospel, was baptized. Now, why would Peter, or excuse me, why would Philip baptize these people if they really weren't believers? If he thought that in any way they were faking it or just playing around? No, these were truly believers. Even the apostles in Jerusalem believed these people were being saved. Peter and John uh, were sent to, not to preach a message of salvation. They didn't go up there and say, go up there and, and make sure these people are believing. That wasn't the message at all. They were sent to pray that they might receive the Holy Spirit. That was the message of the work of John, the, of John and Peter were to go and, and to pray that these disciples, these new Christians would receive the Holy Spirit. So the Samaritans were definitely saved, but listen, Again, this, this opened my mind as a young man, and as I've studied, it continues that way. These Samaritans were saved, but they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Why, do I, why am I emphasizing that? Because so many, I'll say uh, denominations, so many uh, Bible teachers want us to believe. Are you following me this morning? So many Bible believers, teachers, want us to believe that when you get saved, you've received the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Anybody ever heard that taught? That when you get saved, you've received the Holy Spirit fully. But can I tell you, that's not apparently what took place. These people were saved, they were baptized, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. See, salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit for us to be born again. In John chapter three, it's verse six, it says this, that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
In the NIV, it says it this way, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, notice the capital, the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Titus 3 and 5 says this, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. So when we get saved, when we are born again, that is something that the Holy Spirit does. He comes into our life and he does a work of, of regenerating our spirit man or giving us new life in our spirit man. When we sin, when we were born actually in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned. And what did God say? When you'd sin, you will surely die. Well, they did. They died right then. The moment they sinned, they died. Not physically, spiritually. He was speaking of a spiritual thing. Their spirit man died. And we inherited that situation, that condition. We are born into sin. The moment we are born, our spirit man is already dead within us. But when we become born again, when Jesus, we put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and he regenerates our spirit man. We are born again. That was the word Jesus used. Unless a man be born again. And Nicodemus said, how can a man enter into his mother's world? He wasn't talking about the physical. He was talking about the spiritual. So when we are born again, it is the Holy Spirit that comes and he works in our life. But that is not the receiving of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you one more verse. John chapter 20, verse 22. Now this is after the resurrection. This is the first time that Jesus walks in the room with his disciples. They had not seen him yet, okay? They'd heard that he was alive, they hadn't seen, but now he's in the room. Suddenly he's just there in the room. And he says this to them. When Jesus first saw his disciples after his resurrection, he said, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And this is where many people say, see, when you're born again, you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. No, this is that born again work. The disciples hadn't been born again yet. Nobody had ever been born again because Jesus had just died on the cross and was just resurrected. So these disciples already had their faith. So Jesus then released the Holy Spirit to come into their lives and to give them new birth, that they would be born again. They received the Holy Spirit. You understand that? Does that make sense to you? That, that night, that day, up in that upper room, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They were born again. They were regenerated in their spirit. Just like in the Garden of Eden, when God breathed into man and he became a living spirit, the Bible says. And then he died at sin that living spirit died. But when Jesus died on the cross, hallelujah, and he was raised from the dead, we were given the privilege and the opportunity to be born again. And I pray today that every one of you in this place has experienced that new birth. That is a supernatural moment in our lives. It's not just something that, that suddenly we put in our heads. It's a supernatural moment when the Holy Spirit comes and gives us new life through our faith in Jesus Christ. But it is not the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So as I was reading this a couple of weeks ago, I, I'd read it many times and it dawned on me. Have I got you this morning? I feel like we're really being distracted. I see a lot of turning away. I see a lot of turning down. I, I really want you to grab this today. I, I was wondering, God, here's a man, Philip, who's doing signs and miracles among the people. I mean, this is a man full of the Holy Ghost and power. People are being healed. Uh, demons are being cast out. I mean, we're talking about power in the spirit why in the world could could philip not give them the baptism of the holy spirit why was it not taking place i mean what more do they need this this is man full of the holy ghost why can't he lay his hand on them and they receive the holy spirit why was it not happening 
And that's why I read those verses I read at the beginning. It was like the Lord said, for your instruction. For your instruction. So that you could see the fullness of the truth of what the Holy Spirit is really all about. This to me makes it so absolutely clear that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and salvation are two separate works. Now, you can be saved and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit all at the, whole, at the same time. I believe that can happen, but that doesn't mean it's the same thing. It's two very separate works. They can occur concluently or con- same time, whatever that word might be, con something, and it ends in an itly. <laughs> con- congruently, congruently. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. Anyway, they can happen at the same time, but they're separate works. So I want you to understand that. And I want us to see that fully this morning. Why didn't it happen that way? I believe because God wanted us to see this. Maybe Philip wasn't even preaching about the Holy Spirit. You know, it was early in the church history. Maybe Philip was just preaching a message of salvation. Maybe his preaching, his teaching was all about receiving Jesus, this man who had been crucified in their lifetime, probably only months or maybe a year before that. We're not exactly sure of the time period, but, but they had seen him. They had recognized Jesus. Now they're being asked, he has died, been buried in a tomb. They're being asked to place their faith in him as the Messiah. Maybe that's where his focus in his preaching was on. But I think maybe it was all about us learning something more. And two important doctrines. The first one, I've already begun to talk about, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a separate work from salvation. The Bible says that the disciples or the apostles sent Peter and John up there because the Spirit had not fallen on them yet. That's not my not not my words. That's what the scripture says. And you read it in a lot of different translations. You can look up the Greek. What it says in the original Greek is fell upon them. <laughs> it's not complicated. It's not hard. The spirit had not fallen on them yet. They were saved. Yes. Yes, they were saved. They were born again. They were baptized but they had not received something else that the Holy Spirit falling upon them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, whatever you might want to call it, it's this empowerment, this deeper relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. The second thing I think we need to see from this scripture is not only that the reality of it's a separate work from salvation, is that there was clearly, clearly an outward evidence of their being baptized in the Holy Spirit. When Peter and John came and laid hands upon them, something was happening. Because Simon says, wow, look at that. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to lay hands on people and see that happen to them. What was it? It doesn't say here. But yet when we read through other testimony of Scripture in the book of Acts, the, the, the common thing that we see over and over again is the speaking 